Welcome back to another great edition of the Crossboard Interviews. My name is Christopher Brown, the host of the show, and I'm pleased and honored to have one of the two candidates running for the Maverick Party leadership on May 14th. The vote is to be taking place. Uh, he is the candidate of record for the Maverick Party in Banff Airdrie, and that is Tarek Nelga. Tarek, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you. Happy Tuesday as this airs, but happy as Friday. It, as it airs, you betcha. So it is Tuesday for all yeah, of you, you are currently totally heading out to Brooks, Alberta right now. As Absolutely. This, this evening. Is, the, yeah. Exactly. Um, Tarek, let's get the party started. And my first question to any politician who ever comes on the show is, where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, it's it's really easy, I would say. So it was one of those things where I could sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Or uh, worse, I could complain and complain and complain and do nothing. And that gets me nowhere, right? You could rant uh, as much as you want on social media. You could rant uh, as much as you want uh, to your friends, and to your social group, uh, you know, out when you're having a meal. But then what does that do? Uh, it, it really It really does nothing. And I, I hit the point where it's like, I'm looking for, it was really a combo of I'm looking for a political home. And then two, once I find a political home, let me help um, and, and let me do something about it. And I think I've got a story to tell and I think I've got a journey to tell and a, and a mission to accomplish. So uh, that's why. So you talk about a mission and we'll talk about your leadership uh policies and sort of what you're hearing mm. at the what you're hearing from westerners as you crisscross western canada but i want to still talk about you because i want my listeners to know a little bit more about you what sure. is your mission what is the mission that you have set out because you're relatively new to canada mm. uh 2010 if i'm not mistaken if i've got my date correct, correct. So 2012 i moved here 2010 was the first time i visited so 2012 so 10 years this year 10 well happy yeah. 10 years i guess thank you <laughs> um, thank you so what is the mission you've found in your 10 years of being in Canada? So I, I moved here, like many people know, I moved here to, to rodeo. So I fell in love with the Western lifestyle. I'd been to the Calgary Stampede once on vacation. That was in 2010. And I thought, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. This is what I'm going to do. And uh, I went home, I quit my job, sold the house, sold the car, uh, moved here in 2010 and I told myself I promised myself I'm going to be the other side of that fence I have no animal experience not like grew up in a house no dog no goldfish nothing um, and joined a riding school uh, joined an ag society started to you know I cut my teeth kind of volunteering at rodeos um, but then started to learn how to ride but that's the story but what I really started to pick up on so i'm an engineer by education and professionally i work in oil and gas what i started to pick on pretty quickly was how unfairly the resource sector was treated uh, in canada by canada uh, it's not by the world but we um you know i i, I grew up through both gulf wars and gulf war one and two which were both resource wars and so you learn very quickly as a kid to the importance and the bargaining tool of what oil does. And here we are given the gift of the third biggest oil reserves in the world that are very um, human rights forward, environmentally forward, et cetera. And we said, yeah, you know what? Keep it in the ground. Don't need it. Don't want it. Don't, don't want to use it. And I thought, in, in what world does this make sense? Um, how does this make sense? So anyways, I... Uh, um, started to think more and more about it. And it took me all of 10 minutes to realize that A, the West gets no fair voice in the Confederation. And then two, um, at the federal level, elections are called before Manitoba starts counting, not before Alberta starts counting. So I thought, this, this doesn't make sense. So the mission became for me, um, the more I learned about it and the more I got frustrated and the more I voted after I became a Canadian citizen, the first one I voted in was the Andrew Scheer election of uh, 2019. And I thought, ah, oh, easy, slam dunk. You know, he's going to win this one. There's been gift after gift from Trudeau in terms of economic, uh, an economic mess, blackface just came out, all that sort of stuff. He's going to nail this one. And then... It was called, I think, within 20 minutes as I was watching the results. And I thought, oh, oh, this is interesting. So I, so I, I thought, you know, when, when does this resolve itself? Because we're at the mercy of Montreal and Toronto voting 
in favor of the West, and they never will. Their values are fundamentally different. So my mission became, and I put it very simply, I have a hashtag and this has become my campaign slogan. Uh, we're actually gonna get hats made, is hashtag Adios Ottawa. Is um, I, my, if my political legacy in Canada is to make Ottawa irrelevant in the lives of Western Canadians, I have done my job. Um, I want to push um, our own governance back into the provinces so that we manage our own money, our own finances, our own laws, our own energy resources, etc. Um, Self-manage it here in the West and have nothing to do with Ottawa. That is that is my goal. So just to get back on you for a little bit before Please. we go into that. Getting into politics is a huge beast in itself. As a former candidate myself, I know the challenges of crisscrossing, but uh, I grew up in a political household. For you, was politics something that was discussed at the dinner table, or did you come into it when you moved to uh, Alberta? In, interesting question. So you're always very politically aware around things like resource management and foreign policy management. So I grew up within a 90-minute flight radius of Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, Israel, um, Iraq, Iran. Iran's a 30-minute flight away. Um, so every major modern war um, that you think of in the last 20, 30 years outside of the Ukraine um, now, I've lived around. Uh, so you very quickly are exposed to foreign policy politics, especially around U.S. foreign policy politics, um, but also around politics of natural resources and the economy. It's a, it's a very visible element. Interestingly enough, though, as much as we talk about it, um, I grew up in a region where it is not democratic. Uh, it is, a, you know, there are no elections. Uh, it is a monarchy, a sheikdom, uh, and there, but then there is a functional government. Now, the best way I would describe it is I grew up in a friendly dictatorship, like a friendly capitalistic area. A weird, um, weird two, two words to put together, but understandable, I guess. Exactly. Like, again, very open, very modern, very human rights forward, um, and also very capitalistic. They said well, this this resource that we have is going to provide an immense amount of wealth for the nation, is going to pay for excellent education, excellent health care, etc. Let's go and let's use that to actually diversify the economy. And I moved to a G7 country, you know, the beacon of human rights in the world. Um, and we've decided, you know what, we're going to put Canadian families out of work um, and go ahead and buy that oil from the Middle East or from Venezuela or so on. So I think the number is 21, $22 million of foreign oil a day is bought by Canada. Um, so close to about just under a hair under $2 billion. So I said, this, this, this can't be, this, this can't work. And in my career here in Canada, I, I've worked out of Fort Mac, Fort St. John, Grand Prairie. So all the core um, let's call it gritty oil and gas towns, which I love. I love them. I love working in the field. And it's very rare that, you know, you're like, your colleagues who live there are like, oh, what are you doing this evening? And I'm like, I'm just going to go have a meal order in at the hotel. And they're like, nope, you're coming to my place. Or you're having dinner with my family or so on. And I would sit and say, really? Are these the folks, these evil folks that we're going to put them out of work? Um, so it just, it didn't sit well with me. And so, no, so yes, a, a very, very strong awareness on foreign policy. I think as a kid, you just grow up around it. Your parents talk about it all the time. I remember the night before Gulf War I, my parents taped down the seams of our windows because they were worried about a, a nerve agent attack or a bio attack uh, from Saddam. Um, and then, yeah, we didn't sleep that night. So it's, it's, you, you get exposed to it very quickly. You... You, you seem to have lived a lot of lives in your past, and it seems like when you came to Canada, uh, I assuming you would hope that there'd be some uh, respect and sort of a less of a dictatorship, a friendly dictatorship, as you call it. Um, you came at the time when Stephen Harper was in his majority. Correct. Um, 
let's be honest, while we can talk about Justin Trudeau, which we probably will in a few minutes, right. but let's talk about Stephen Harper. Did you think, or at the time when you came to Canada, mm. were you a conservative member? Did you join the conservative party? And was your evolution in Canadian politics simply just right to the Mavericks? Or was there an evolution? Because you talk about that 2019 election. Right. I want to know how, how a guy moves to Canada, becomes part of the uh, uh, culture in some sense, and then runs for the leadership of the party. So how did the evolution of your Canadian political journey take place? Right, so thank you for that. So again, being very politically attuned and moving here to build a new life and moving here specifically for the Western way of life, right? Like I jumped right into it and I'm very proud that today I've got my own herd of horses. I'm a carded rodeo competitor. Um, it's really, I'm living the dream that I moved here for and I'm really happy about it. Um, and I moved here, like you said, in the final years of the uh, Harper Redford combo. Uh, oh yeah, uh, Redford. Uh, and and I get that Alison Redford had some challenges, etc. But that being said, the year I moved here, this province was on fire. Uh, the West was on absolute fire. It was affordable. It was a low tax jurisdiction. We were developing our resources and you walked in downtown Calgary and people were walking three feet off the air. It was just fire. And people were making good incomes, good disposable incomes. Mind you, these incomes weren't free. They were working hard for them and really hard for them. But they were rewarded for that effort, the entrepreneurship, the risk taking, etc. <laughs> so uh, I moved here. Yes, and absolutely. Uh, I thought the party that would represent me at a federal level uh, would be the Conservatives. And the, the day I became a Canadian citizen, I bought a membership to them because uh, I thought, okay, this is the party that's going to represent my views. And um, by the time I could vote, uh, now this is past Stephen Harper era. So now um, Andrew Shearer's election was the first one that I could vote into at a federal level. And uh, the, the interesting thing as well is, isn't just talking federal, but Within six months of each other, Stephen Harper was gone. And at the time, Alison Redford was gone and Rachel Notley came in. And I thought, oh my God, what just happened? You know, like, how did this happen within six months of each other that we go from this roaring, raging economy to now we're talking borderline, uh, and I'll openly say it, communistic policies um, around tax resource development, et cetera. Um, so when I could vote absolutely like the vast majority, like 99% of Maverick Party supporters, uh, I was a conservative voter uh, and a conservative party member. Uh, and I thought, okay, and Andrew Scheer doesn't give me any charisma whatsoever, doesn't give me um, anything that I could root for, but, you know, I'm not going to vote for Justin Trudeau. So it was, again, rather than giving me something to vote for, I wasn't going to vote for the Trudeau Liberals. He lost that election and didn't, and it wasn't pretty. Like it was, it was not pretty at all. Uh, and then they plunged themselves into a leadership. Uh, um, a election race again. which you're you're in right now. Right. Exactly, a, a leadership race. And uh, uh, I remember the four candidates were Leslie Lewis, Aaron O'Toole, Derek Sloan, who I ran against in the riding here. Um, and super nice guy, by the way. I've met him like through the campaign, total gentleman. And I think he was here not to run against me. He was here to um, stick it to Blake. And I was like, great, you know, why not? Nope, Bring go for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, um, and, and the thing, uh, so, and McKay. And I looked at all four candidates and not one of them was from a Western writing. Uh, so you had a Maritimer and three people from Ontario. And I thought, Where's my voice again? If this is the conservative base, yeah. where is my voice? Where's that Where's that Western candidate to show and, and talk? To? And then Aaron O'Toole won it. And shockingly, Aaron O'Toole won it um, because of his votes in Quebec and promises to Quebec. Um, the one candidate that swept Alberta and Saskatchewan is actually Leslie Lewis. Uh, but just like the general election, Quebec decides for us, not the West, even, even at the CPC. Uh, you know, where this is the base, this is where the money comes from. And Aaron O'Toole in his first week said, Energy East is off the table uh, to Premier Legault and started to make concessions to Quebec. And I thought, that's it, I'm out. That, that was the moment. That and, was 
Anyone who's ever listened to the show knows that I, I, I had the pleasure of being one of, if not the first uh, uh, journalist to interview Aaron O'Toole when he entered into federal politics back in 2012 when he ran for a by-election. Right. Him and I go way back. Him and I do not get along. So I, <laughs> when, when you're talking, I'm like, that's, that's my Aaron O'Toole yeah. that I know. Yeah. <laughs> it says one and- thing and hopes for the other. Exactly. And kept starting to say, you know, Canada's ready for a prime minister from the GTA. Uh, I've hit the point where I really don't care about the GTA. I mean, the, the bless them, the, you know, good luck to them, but, but they continue, they've given us the gift. The GTA area alone has given us the gift of Justin Trudeau for three times in a, in a row. Um, so them doing a, a favor or voting in favor of Alberta or so on, I'm like, I'm out. Um, so anyway, so it was that exact moment where I told myself, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like the conservative party, he's going to lose and he's going to lose epically, which he did. Um, and, and you could tell up at the beginning, like, is this really the best? And then I kept making concession after concession to Quebec. But at that point, I started looking for another political home. And uh, I started reading very briefly about the Maverick Party. And where the parallel came to me about the Maverick Party was I was watching the federal debates and I remember, um, it, you know, Yves Blanchette standing there of the Bloc Québécois and saying, I really don't care about being prime minister. I will never be prime minister. I will work with any of the four of you when he points at the four federal leaders and says, I'll work with any of the four of you that give me what Quebec wants. And I thought, man, where's, where's the Western guy or gal that says that? Where's, where's someone saying, what we want, we get, and we'll work with you. Uh, and I thought, that's brilliant. I wish I had somebody like that for the West. Um, and the Maverick Party is exactly that. It is the bloc of the West that votes only for the interests of Western Canada. And uh, so I, I put out a tweet, and I had at the time 200 followers or something on Twitter, like nothing. I put out a tweet saying, I'm interested in running for the Maverick Party. And that afternoon, Jay Hill called me. Uh, someone had given him my number. And that afternoon, Jay Hill called me and said, what's your story? And I told him. And two months later, after a pretty intensive candidate vetting process, I was announced candidate for the riding in Banff Energy. So I, th- I said, you know, it's enough. I've, I've got to do something about it. The time was right uh, in my life. It was um, an election we knew was coming up because it was a minority government. And the party totally aligned with exactly what I stood for, which is now we're going to put the interests of the West first and nobody else, uh, unapologetically so, and I'm good with it. Now let's talk about, so uh, if, for my listeners who might not know, uh, the election happened 2021. Uh, they didn't win. You're not a member of parliament now. You are no. a candidate. Uh, Jay Hill announces his uh, he's going to step down as interim leader of the Maverick Party. And a leadership race kicks off in January. So January of 2022, the leadership race kicks off. You officially announced within like a few, like I think about two, three months in that you're thinking about it and then you get the paperwork finalized and here we are i want to ask the simple question was it a hard decision to make to join the leadership race because colin for the for anyone listening had announced relatively early in january Mm -hmm. that he was going to run and i was out in airdrie and you said if i don't get on the ballot i'd be happy to support colin and i'm assuming if either way however the vote goes on the 14th you'll both support each other but was it a hard decision to get into the race knowing that you would be leaving Banff Airdrie and crisscrossing the Western Canada for right. probably two months. That's, that's okay. Uh, I, I would say, um, was it a hard decision? Of course, but nothing good comes easy. Um, and right, it's like nothing, nothing good comes easy. And the other thing is I also needed to make sure that everything else was in place in my life. Uh, but I'll tell you about the inspiration that really flipped the switch as to why. Um, because again, I bleed the Maverick message and I had told Jay and I told my writing association, um, they have my full commitment as a future candidate, um, as a board member within the EDAI, but I was kicking around the idea of leadership. The reason being is this is too good of a message to not put effort behind. This isn't about, and, and you're absolutely right, Colin, it took an immense amount of courage for him and, and bravery, and I commend him for that. And you are there. Uh, the one thing I'm going to run is we, 
we build each other up. We don't tear each other down. Like it's, it's, it's the way of the West. Um, you know, and it's actually like, if you think of how we do it in rodeo, your biggest cheerleaders are your competitors. Like it usually is, um, they'll help you with your horse. They'll get you, help you get on. They, you know, so it's, it, it, so I have an immense amount of respect for Colin and, and the one commitment I've made to him and to Jay is that I will continue to support the party, whether I win leadership or not, in whichever capacity that looks like a candidate, a board director, whatever it is. Um, but I, what inspired me to say, I have to do this, uh, was coming back from Ottawa. I went for a period of about five or six days. And what I think was one of the biggest historical moments in modern Canadian history. You know, not all of Canadian history, yeah. but let's call it the last 15, 20 years. I don't think that there's been a movement this big uh, that's kind of captured the country that way. So that you're talking about the convoy, the truckers convoy that went from BC to Ottawa, Correct. just for clarification there. Correct. Correct. And I'd never been to Ottawa before. Uh, and I stood on Wellington Street and looked up at Parliament Hill. And I thought, man, here's a 20 acre plot that makes decisions for how you and I live that has no idea how you and I live or couldn't care less about how you and I live because they don't need a single vote to form power. And I thought, uh, that's it. Um, I'm coming back and I'm running for leadership. I, that was the, that was the inspiration, um, is truly, uh, and I, I looked at it and I said, Ottawa isn't fixable. Uh, we are never going to get a fair deal. I mean, for the, in the easiest example, easiest empirical proof of that is Quebec losing one seat. Um, and the bloc puts in a motion saying, uh oh, we're keeping that one seat. And then 50 conservative MPs, including 10 from the West, including vote. one from Alberta, one yep. concert, well, five technically from Alberta, two, the two liberals, two NDP, and a conservative yes. vote yes, which I still shocked at that, but vote for it so now i'm wondering those four promised seats that we were going to get how's this going to work in terms of distribution when quebec's not going to lose theirs so i looked at it and i said if, if we can't and people are like oh we'll get electoral reform i'm like if quebec can't lose a seat what are we going to get um you know so i don't think and, and time is of it's urgent because in my let's call it canadian lifetime of now 10 years i have seen what Ottawa could do. So can you imagine another five years? Um, and we know the Trudeau single alliance is now gonna last until 2025. Um, so I came back and I said, no, I believe in the Maverick message of decentralizing Ottawa's power um, on all matters that really you and I care about. Which during your, during your uh, question and answer session out in Airdrie, which I attended, but I mm -hmm. took some photos, covered it. I, I remember you saying a comment because there's a very weird belief on Twitter. And I know you should never believe what's on Twitter because it's mm -hmm. a microcosm of our society. And honestly, at the end of the day, people need to get a life if they think Twitter is the app, be all, end all of what's right. happening in those worlds. But you said, when asked the question about uh, independence, Western independence. You said, and if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe you said autonomy first, independence if needed. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. So when the 2021 election happened, there was a massive undertone of people saying that the Maverick Party is a complete Western independence party. They want to leave. They're going to vote split. But you're saying that's the opposite of what you believe in what the Maverick Party believes, correct? So, so no, the, the Maverick Party's official platform. Now, you're absolutely right. The media labeled us as separatists. And yes. I will be the first to say, we have people in the party that want to leave Canada as a country tomorrow night. Like, they're like, get us out tomorrow night. And we have others who are still attached to the Maple Leaf, but are not attached to Ottawa. Uh, so they still want to cheer for Team Canada and still feel a sense of pride when it comes to non-political things. But in terms of politics and self-governance, get us out. And the model for that is really not different than Quebec, which has declared itself a nation within a nation, manages its own taxation, own immigration laws, own language laws, own finance laws, own healthcare laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
if it's good for them, why isn't it good for us? So the words I used, you're very close. The words I used is independence first, separation if necessary. Um, I apologize. I've no, that, you're, you're golden. You're golden. Thank you for being there. It meant, meant a lot that you were there. So thank you. Hey, um, I, I try to get to all these events because I think it's important to hear all sides of the story. And honestly, I, you put on your pants the exact same way as uh, I do. We can have a civil conversation. Like at the end of the day, we may not agree on 100% of the things, but you know what we do agree on? We have the right to free speech. God bless Absolutely. the world. <laughs> I, I completely agree. I completely agree. And um, so, so, and again, it's a, this is the beauty of it. We live in a democracy and there's options. Like when I ran, there was nine candidates on the ballot. Nine. That's, and it's funny because I got asked about, you know, Derek Sloan running and how do you feel about him? I'm like, it's a democracy. You can do whatever he wants. It, the rules are, are um, you could run in any federal writing. You do not have to have an address uh, in that writing. I can run in Nova Scotia if I wanted to. Like it's, yeah. it's you know. I that I disagree with, but that's, yeah. just, that's just me nor here nor there. Um, I, I, I hear you. So, so yes, to answer your question. So independence first. And by, by independence, I don't necessarily mean a separate country, but complete and total political independence for model. That, that's my baseline. So how do we do that? That's the that's the million dollar question because right. you 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 have been open and uh, transparent on social media that you do not need to win one vote west of Manitoba, like east of Manitoba. I apologize. Correct. Anything in the GTA, Montreal, Nova Scotia, it does not matter to you. Right. But the issue is though, how do you do that? How do you get independence for Westerners? In a society where Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal, Quebec City have more seats than Alberta, Saskatchewan combined. Great. So I'll give you a number of ways of doing it. But the first easy example is you don't need to become prime minister to cause some trouble in the house. And the easiest example I'll give of that is Yves Blanchette or Jagmeet Singh. Um, heck, I would say, and uh, I mean, it's very unfortunate, but a highly effective anti-Alberta marketing machine is in one seat um, with hold it, held by someone called Elizabeth May. Uh, like Elizabeth May is in a highly effective anti-Alberta machine. There's there's through and through anti-West machine, anti-Alberta, Saskatchewan, any heavy re resource really. So how does she get that much power with one seat? Um, so the way to do it, and I look at Yves Blanchette, he put that motion forward and got support of the house because in return, you get support this way or that. Way. So can you imagine a block of 30, 40, 50 members? They don't have to form them, but they come in and say, whoever wants this bill passed, and it could be bills that have nothing to do with Alberta. If you want my votes, this is what I want. Now, how to do it and how to bring political independence to Alberta is to do it systemically step-by-step on all federally regulated industries and then start to break them down. So do it one by one. So for example, transport, aviation and pipelines all, all, all fall under one umbrella. Can you imagine if we deregulated aviation and had a Western uh, aviation authority that managed our own airports, our own airlines and our own transport rules? Because right now, 5 million Canadians cannot get on an airplane based on their medical status, right? We could control that. Um, just, it, to, we, just to follow up on that, though, because I apologize for interrupting. I hate interrupting, but no, go you, ahead. You, you said that before at the Airdrie, and I wanted to ask the question, but you were talking with actual supporters and I didn't want to interrupt. But no, please. Doesn't that cost more at the end of the day? If you subdivide aviation into a Canadian federal, mm. do not does that not put a burden on the taxpayers of Western Canada in some sense? And how do you offset that tax increase with Western independence autonomy? Great. So I'll actually, uh, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll argue otherwise, as a matter of fact. And, Love the, it. Reason, and the reason being is, um, uh, the easiest example is CPP versus, let's say, an APP. So uh, a Canada Pension Plan versus an APP. Uh, there's a couple of studies out. It would cost 20% cheaper in administrative costs to rely less on Ottawa and more on Alberta to manage it. And it's also where that money comes from. So today I'll ask you, go book a flight to Toronto, right? And look at your fare versus your taxes, fees and surcharges. 
right? Um, those taxes, fees, and surcharges are today set by the federal government. Now, in an entrepreneurial private sector forward Saskatchewan and Alberta, who would do a better job at managing aviation authorities? And who would do a more efficient job at managing aviation authorities? Would it be the federal government or would it be private contractors? Right now, you can't go to private contractors because all airport leases, including let's say Calgary, are federally managed. The other thing is if you then could create more competitive laws around airlines setting up, Canada has incredibly stringent laws around setting up airlines. Um, and I don't mean from a safety standpoint, which should stand, safety and security stand, but I'm talking about commercial competitiveness. And what that does is, I'll ask you a question, why is it cheaper for you to fly out of Canada than inside? I've never understood that concept. That, uh, that it, it costs me more to go visit my family in Ontario than it is oh, for me to go to Mexico. Like, 100%. how weird is that? It is cheaper for me, I did the numbers, it's cheaper for me to go to Paris or London than it is for me to go to the Maritimes. Um, so a different continent. Um, and mind you people, it's, it's a lot, way longer distance, but it's way cheaper for me. And the reason being is, again, over-regulation. So I really looked into this. And it was one of those things where it is so layered with regulation and red tape from the federal government, because that creates government jobs. Um, and it, it layers and layers the bureaucracy that keeps the liberals in power. So um, what if we went to private contractors to manage our aviation in Saskatchewan and Alberta? So I would argue it would actually be a cheaper, be more accessible, three faster to implement any upgrades or so on than relying on, on the federal government. Today, Calgary Airport leases, pays a lease for that airport of $28 million a year to the federal government that they get nothing back in return, nothing. Can you imagine if we save those $28 million? They'll get passed on to you. Um, the reason why it costs you so much to land in Ontario is Pearson is, if not the most expensive, second most expensive airport to land in, in terms of ramp fees uh, in the country. So $17,000 every time an A320 or a Boeing 737 touches, land, touches wheels. Just that's the, the ramp fee, just the park um, is $17,000. Heathrow, by example, I'm not going to talk like, you know, some airport in nowhere in the middle what? of the forest. You Heathrow, know. everyone knows Heathrow. Yeah, Heathrow is $9,000. Um, so, so carbon tax. Exactly. That's another reason why it's cheaper for you to fly. If you're going, let's say to Vegas on vacation, it's cheaper for you to fly on an American airline than a Canadian one, because that one's been fueled without a carbon tax. But your WestJet or Air Canada has been fueled with a carbon tax. Um, so we've intentionally, like most industries in Canada, our problems are made in Canada. We've intentionally shot ourselves in the foot. So, so to answer your question, sorry, it's a long answer. I, I love it though. <laughs> All right. But, uh, thank you. But it's a long answer is to start to say, let us manage our own regulations. So can you imagine if we had control over cross-border pipelines, um, in Alberta, we can negotiate with Montana, Idaho, and the Dakotas way better than Ottawa can negotiate for us. Jason Kenney just announced about an hour ago, um, Senator Manchin is coming up to visit the oil sands to pressure Joe Biden to buy Canadian oil versus being on the phone, which they didn't pick up the phone, uh, with the Saudis and, and the Emiratis to pump more oil. So um, can you imagine if we had our own self-marketing? for our own resources and our own self-management for our own resources. So start to break that down, so institution by institution and deregulate federal industries just as good as Quebec has. The reason why Quebec does it is because they've asked. Nobody at a federal level has ever asked for Western Canada yet. I plan to be that guy. I. I want to go back to sort of the oil and gas sector here for Please. a second, because I'm so happy you talked about mention because I saw that and I was like, I, I want to try and subtly put that in, but you already did it for me. So I don't have Please. to. Um, the running thing that I hear all the time when people talk about independence for Western Canada is it would be harder to build pipelines in an independent uh, Western nation uh, sector or however you want to put it, because now you have to deal with Canada, even uh, you, you have to deal with Ottawa, 
even though we're already dealing with Ottawa and we yeah. can't get it done. So what gives you the impression that if we are an independent uh, nation, independent country, mm. that we would have a better shot of actually getting pipelines built compared to how things are right now? Easy, because we then become in the driver's seat. Uh, so can you imagine, again, we want to get a, a pipeline out to BC. If we had management of the transport sector, okay, any BC goods that go through Alberta get a 20% tariff until a pipeline's built. Done, right? Like done. Uh, and if, if you don't like it, you could then import your oil, but oh, by the way, Ottawa has a tanker ban on, on uh, tankers coming in on the West Coast. So the thing is then we become in the driver's seat and we have, like one of the things I will always fault Jason Kenny on is the turn off the taps thing. Uh, he, he threatened it and he's like, oh, can you imagine if we turned off the tap for three days? Three days. Three days, would, three minutes. Exactly. It would cripple the economy. Um, we, so let's give them what they want. They want us to phase out the oil sands. We'll do it really quickly. Uh, we could do it over a period of three days and see how that works out. Um, so, so, so the thing is, there's mechanisms of doing this economically um, that say, now we've got the ability to do this for ourselves. And we've got the ability to negotiate for ourselves. You're right. I think we would be in a better position to negotiate with Ottawa if we spoke for ourselves rather than rely on their blessings. Because right now we rely on their blessings. And they'll never give us their blessings. There is zero political capital in giving Alberta what it wants. None. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Let's talk about what you need to do before May 14th. You are 32 days out as of airing this from the leadership. You are in Brooks tonight uh, on yep. April 12th. You are crisscrossing Western Can uh, Canada right. to talk to uh, Westerners. Right. What are you hearing from them? And what are what is the message they are giving you as the candidate? Right. Great. Thank you. So I'm doing, because of how time is limited and the fact that we've got an immense amount of space, uh, the vast majority of my campaign, and I think also this is the future of Canadian politics, is going to be electronic. So uh, the vast majority of my campaign is now electronic. It doesn't mean we're not talking to people. It doesn't mean we're not engaging. Um, it's just that we are physically not in a room. And, and let's be honest, if you're going to take your kids to hockey practice on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night, um, and, or you have the option of going to some political town hall, you're going to take your kids to hockey practice. That being said, while you're at hockey practice, you're doing this. Um, and, and I just held up my phone for those who are on the audio. Um, <laughs> I learned from the best. Yeah, so, um, so the thing is, um, you would be scrolling and, and looking at it. So one of the things I really need to do is to start to push out content on what my platform is. So I've put out a 10 point platform. I've got an incredible team that's helping me with my electronic channeling. And that's actually translates into the digital strategy that I have for the Maverick Party. Because regardless of whether you sit on the left, right, center, et cetera, if I can have you only leave your house for one political engagement, which is to vote, um, I'll give you everything else electronically. So, um, it, you know, so that's, that's my, my main. And what I'm looking to do is one, obviously sell memberships. So continue to do that, continue to push the message of the Maverick party in general, and my leadership message as to why uh, why, why should Tarek become leader of the Maverick Party? Um, and fundraise too as well. I'm hoping to fundraise enough that I'd like to be able to put out, let's call it eight to 10 professionally produced 30 second videos of my political policies. So you get that information quick, you're in, you're out. One of my visions again uh, for the party is I wanna be the first federal party that has a voter and constituent engagement app. Um, where uh, you have direct access to your MP, 
uh, if there's a bill in the house that you want to see how they vote on, don't write a letter. Who writes a letter anymore, um, right? So give me real time polling and say, how would you like me to vote in the house? And then it also allows us to push content to our constituents and to our voters. So I really wanna bring the party into today's world and make it very accessible and say, hey, you don't have to attend a town hall. You don't have to physically come in. And, and it applies really across rural Canada. Today, I rodeo quite a bit, and that's the one way we pass around information for events and so on. Um, this myth that you know rural Canada isn't connected or something actually is. Um, and does it mean we, we're not doing physical events? We are, like Brooks, for example, uh, but the vast majority of my events and just engagements is going to be uh, via, via electronic channels. Now, the second part of your question, because I didn't answer it all. But no, you go, don't have to. Um, go, go, is, yeah, is go what, finish off and then I'll ask the next follow-up. No, is what am I hearing? Um, yes. So whether that's in person or on the phone or uh, via email or, or social or whatever. What I'm hearing is a really strong frustration uh, with, uh, with the current situation, both at a provincial and federal level. Uh, because where, where are we going to start putting the West first? Um, and, you know, we'd like equal footing. At the very least, because we're not there, but we're 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 when are we going to start putting the West first? So I'm hearing that I'm hearing a strong frustration with Ottawa. We continue to see it, and the other thing is I think Westerners are starting to realize that, and this was one of the hardest part of my my federal campaign was telling them, your vote will never determine who becomes prime minister ever, regardless of which political party you support, you know, uh, your vote will never determine it. By the time um, you are voting, it is done. It is called. Um, so now start voting for what you really want. Uh, and I think that's what I'm hearing and people want self-governance. So are there, and again, to answer your question, are there separatists out there? There are, and that's okay. Again, it's a free country and they're allowed to uh, we're all allowed to think of what we want to say and do and so on, but I think that there's a good groundswell support of self-governance in Western Canada. We, we mentioned the word Trudeau and mm -hmm. we, we have to have open Pandora's sure. box here. Trudeau is not well liked in Western Canada. There right. are two seats in two provinces in uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta. BC, it's a weird entity in itself. Rural, right. uh, the rural Western Canadian bloc kind of goes conservative. Mm -hmm. Conservatives are in the midst of a leadership election as well, yeah. and they have a very strong front runner. Yeah. If you are the leader, you would have to potentially go up against Pierre Polivier, who mm -hmm. is a Calgarian but living in, uh, uh, mm -hmm. in Carleton. Sorry. He is well liked. Mm -hmm. But how do you go up against a guy who, and say he's not, he won't stand up for Western values or Western right. uh, ideas when he's from the area right. that we currently reside in? Right. So great question. And I'll answer that in two ways. Rather than go against him, I'll go with him. So here's, here's my plan. If Pierre wins, um, and I've gone on record saying this too, and I will go after Aaron O'Toole any day and every day. But I said, if by some miracle, he wins the GTA and the Maverick wins a block of seats uh, and he needs to form minority government. We'll help him form minority government. Um, but here's our list of demands. The same stands with Pierre Polyev. I sure do hope for, for the good of the country that he wins in Montreal and in Toronto because that's all he needs to become prime minister. Now, the question is, will he win in Montreal or Toronto? I don't know. And quite frankly, I don't control that vote. It's and honestly, them. at the end of the day, do you care? <laughs> well, I mean, I'd like, I'd like it. But the question is, if Montreal and Toronto have voted for Jagmeet Singh and Justin Trudeau three times in a row, what's going to be different the fourth time? Right? Uh, because I mean, we've seen the financial scandals. We've seen the financial mismanagement. We've seen um, what kind of state in the country is in. But three times, including during a pandemic election that changed one seat, one seat in the entire house, a $600 million one seat change. So the thing is, rather than go against prayer, I think the biggest message to tell Westerners over the next three years is you could vote for Maverick and the commitment we're making is no different than what NDP, what the NDP did with Justin Trudeau and said, 
you want our backing? Great, we'll give it to you, but here's our list of demands. Um, so he's well liked, but that being said, and I'll point this out, two things. One, it's not about Pierre and what he stands for. It's about what he needs to do to win. So just like Aaron O'Toole had to make concession after concession after concession to Quebec and to Toronto, at what point is Pierre going to make those concessions to win at the expense of Western Camp? So he's well liked. That being, and the second thing is, by the time he can run for PM, he will be an MP for 21 years in 20, 2025 in an Ottawa area riding. So the question becomes then, who's he representing? Why isn't he running in a Western riding? He has been an MP longer than he lived in Calgary. Uh, actually, that's uh, probably close because he went to university in Calgary. So I don't know what at what age he left. He, I think um, he was 19 when he started working for Jason Kenney in Ottawa. Right, right. So, so there. So the thing becomes then, why isn't he? I've yet to see. I don't care where you're from, um, be, but because the West is very inclusive. But the question is, where are you running? And who are you running for? And if you're running again in an Ottawa area riding, Carlton, where are your Western interests? I have yet to see beyond the carbon tax, uh, one policy that really talks in the Pierre Polyev camp about it. Now, that being said, just like there is a popular vote, Quebec will determine leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada, not the prairies. Believe me, I will put an uh, I'll put money on it. He will sweep Alberta and Saskatchewan CPC leadership vote. Pierre will do it by a factor of 90% plus, easily. But there's Jean Charest, uh, who is French, is running in a Quebec area riding, or will be running in one, who has come in favor of the carbon tax, come out in favor of former, wasn't he former premier of Quebec, if I'm not mistaken? Former right? liberal premier. Liberal of Quebec. Premier. Yeah, exactly. Now, if the Quebec ridings of the CPC put him up on top, one of my jobs as leader is to get the Maverick Party ready for September because there will be droves of folks saying, yeah, not again. So that's my two strategies, is if Charest wins, I want out tomorrow night. If Pierre wins, I will run with him. And I will publicly be the first one to say, I hope you win. I really do, because for the good of the country, the most ideal thing for Western Canada was for Pierre to win, backed by a block of Mavericks that make him prime minister. Can you imagine the power we have? And say, you want to become PM? Here's our list of demands. In that situation, you, you talked earlier on about Yves-Francois Blanchet, who was the mm. leader of the Bloc Quebecois, and you said during the first, I think it was 2019 or even 20, 2021, he said, I know I'm never going to be prime minister. Yeah. I will work with anyone. And this is going to be a loaded question, but I feel like you're up for Please. it. At any time, do you think you would ever be able to work across the aisle or work with Justin Trudeau as prime minister? Uh, work with or press, work, work pressure, right? Because right now, every cons Western conservative MP, and I say if they would have done their jobs, Chris, you wouldn't have even the need for the Maverick Party is there isn't a single one that is standing up and speaking exclusively for the benefit of Western Canada, even if it comes at the detriment of Quebec. Because they are worried, again, party alliances for them to win and form government, they have to win in Quebec and Ontario. And that's the problem, is it doesn't matter if it's Charest or if it's Pierre or so on, you'll get different versions. Some are better than others. But they will have to appeal to the values of Eastern Canada, which are fundamentally different than the West. So what are our values in your in your own words? What right. is a Western value? Because so, I think there's a lot of people who, and I'll be honest, I have Western, I have Eastern Canadian listeners to the show because right. I'm from Ontario and I right. came out here. But what is a Western value that an Easterner might not think they're actually addressing at, in Ottawa? So we've seen the East continue to vote for big government, large government control high tax environment, an anti-resource, anti-development, anti-entrepreneurship policies. Um, that might work for some people. So it's a free country and that group of the country has actively voted for socialism. Um, and, and again, because Justin Trudeau didn't magically happen, 
someone elected him there. And um, as many people would comment on Twitter, oh, the election was stolen. I think our action elections are perfect. It's paper ballots. We don't have machines at a federal level. Um, I think that they are pretty accurate, bar those last 200,000 votes that they called, but I don't think they would have made a difference. Yes. Um, that being said, I really think that our elections are not a fraud. Now, our electoral turnout is pretty disappointing, but that's not a, that's not a fault of the election system. Um, that's just people not getting out to vote. But um, the, there is enough Canadians in the most critical parts of the country, the East, that will vote for active socialism versus Western Canada that is trying to vote for a free market economy, a low tax jurisdiction, entrepreneurship, and individual responsibility and small government. That's what we're voting for. And those are two very fundamentally different values. So um, again, it, it's, that, that's, if to answer your question, that's, that's the value difference. So how do you do that in Western Canada? Because I, I will be upfront and blunt mm -hmm. with you. You go talk to people in Edmonton, you go talk mm -hmm. to people in Vancouver, you go talk to people in Saskatoon, Regina. You are going to hear a swath of different opinions on how things need to go forward. So how do you, as the leader of the Maverick Party, if elected on May 14th, will you be able to bring those, those different opinions, different uh, statements, different outlooks on what a true Western representation looks like Right. And form a policy that is going to appease everyone, because we're talking about trying to appease everyone in Canada. But if we um, can't do that in Canada, how do you think you can do it in Western Canada? Yeah. So great question. And I think the biggest one for that is to sell the message of prosperity and autonomy. Right now, nobody's selling that. Right. And 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 self-governance is saying, I'm not going to be the one that governs you. You decide how you want to be governed. So it's pushing stronger power into the provinces to make their decisions rather than the federal government. Now, you're absolutely right. I think, like I think downtown Vancouver or even metropolitan Edmonton, metropolitan Edmonton, at, even at a provincial level, is very orange, very orange, right? That's okay. Um, it's not where we start. Uh, so again, as leader of the party, one, I want to make sure that we've got quality and we don't compromise because that's what happened with O'Toole and will happen inevitably with whoever is the future leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. They're going to start to have to compromise to win Toronto and Montreal because that's how you come prime minister. So um, my plan is to say, let's take 40 or 50 writings in Western Canada that we could truly have a solid impact in winnable writings. And in a party that's new and with limited resources, why spread out over, and this is this actually is quite different than what the Maverick Party is putting out today. And I, I, I fundamentally say, what's the ROI on running a candidate in downtown Vancouver? Nothing, right? Um, so let's not run a candidate in downtown Vancouver. Uh, but let's run candidates in what I call today writings that are a predominantly suburban, rural Berea writings that are have no voice because I'll, I'll, I'll flip it and say, if you ask someone in a rural writing today in Alberta and Saskatchewan, do you have a voice federally or provincially? They'll tell you they don't. Um, so why, why don't they get a voice, right? And why don't they get a mechanism of pushing that? If there's enough momentum of 50 Mavericks that we could send to house, that's my target, 50, right? Out of 100 and potentially 11 ridings in the West. If we could get a block of 50 Mavericks to go to Ottawa versus let's say the block of Equa has 31 seats and say, we'll work with anybody that starts to push autonomy back, back into the provinces, that's step one for me. One of the things I heard after the election from some of the candidates from the Maverick party was they were upset that not a not every Western riding had a candidate mm. for the Maverick Party. Now, I want, I want to ask this question uh, because uh, I think it's important. Please. While you're talking about rural and suburban, mm. a full slate of candidates makes it seem like you are truly looking for people and votes in all parts of Western Canada. Mm. 
will you try to run a candidate each riding west of Manitoba or will you, or sorry, Manitoba West, mm -hmm. or are you looking at just those 50 potential swings ridings where you know you could potentially pick up? Right, so great question. I, I would answer that in two ways. One is on resources. So if resources and time were unlimited, <laughs> then spread it, right? Uh, but the same way you make investment decisions and say, I want the highest ROI to start with, especially as we are establishing ourselves, then I would go and say, where are the ridings that have the biggest return on investment? And I would actually argue in today's world that the autonomy sentiment in Saskatchewan is bigger than in Alberta. I think I mentioned that in, in, uh, in a meeting. Yeah. Um, I, I think we have a higher chance of winning in Saskatchewan, a, a little bit higher than Alberta, um, uh, because I think that there's, there's strong autonomy sentiment there. And also there's a premier, probably the only premier in Canada will always think of Saskatchewan first before thinking of the Confederation. Um, I think Scott Moe is the least federalist of the premiers, and, and I like him for it. So um, that being said, so that's one. Two is quality of candidates. So we don't want um, to pick 111 names. We want 111 representatives of the community and true representatives of the community. So the thing is, because again, putting actually filing to run in an election, like I told you, you could run in any writing. You don't need to live in that address. And it's I think four different forms to fill out and you're, you're done, you're golden. Um, I don't want that. Uh, so it's not for the sake of just being on the ballot. It is truly being a representative of that community. And I think that should stand regardless of which party or which side of the political spectrum you, you sit on. I truly believe that you need to live in the area or at least in the vicinity um, to run. You're speaking my language. Right. I have been attacking every can every party who says we're going to run a candidate every riding are they going to be local no then don't run a candidate every exactly. riding if they are a paper name get them off the ballot yep. if they do not live in the riding you do not deserve the right to run in that riding that's my oh absolutely i completely agree um, right? so for example if you were running in airdrie and you lived in north calgary it's fine right like i get it you're five but if you right? are running in airdrie and you live in saskatoon right exactly Exactly. Right. So, 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 you know, these are, um, I want to be And the other, the third part of this is also groundswell support. So the biggest part of running is, is forming local electoral district associations, EDAs, and making sure that you have a good, strong board and good, strong volunteers. So if there aren't any, then why? Right. Again, there's got to be support on the ground, especially for a new party. Let's go where people really want to be represented, uh, where we can get a representative from the community that is strong, that is credible, that will accurately represent that community. We are about an hour and 15 minutes into this, and I want to start my wrap up because I don't want to be, it feels like it's only been like 20 minutes, but that's the great thing. I know. Conversations are great like this. We'll have you back on if you win. If you don't win, we'll have you back on to talk <laughs> politics. Um, how can people reach out? Because we've talked about a lot in the last hour and 15 minutes, and then guarantee you there's someone on the Deerfoot or Highway 2 right now yelling at their car radio listening to this saying, why didn't you ask them this? Well, how can they reach out to you and get involved or potentially ask a question to potentially sign up? Absolutely. So easiest way and it goes direct and uh, in real time is digital. Um, so my website is tarekalnaga.ca. Uh, just my name, and on it are all the links to my socials, so that's uh, Facebook, Insta, the Twitter, um, and, and uh, an email address as well, or a contact form you could fill up. So there's multiple multiple mechanisms. It goes straight to me and straight to my team right away, um, and we've been answering back at every message. So that's the best way. It also gives you an insight into my platform, what I stand for. Interviews, we'll post this podcast up uh, on there when it's um, when it's out. So on Tuesday uh, yeah. and uh, on today, tonight. you mean? Yeah, today, today, <laughs> yeah. Yes, today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
for those who have listened to the show before, you know what I'm about to say. If you want to follow uh, Tarek, uh, please scroll down in the show notes. Scro- show notes, his, the link to his website, his social media accounts, his, web, uh, his email address are all going to be there. Click on him, follow him, and send him a message. So that way he doesn't have to ra- uh, like list off the exact spelling each time. So there will be in the show notes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, my last question, and this is the, the sort of a fun sort of question. Please. Why you? Uh, um, I think it's so great question. So one, I'm not running for me. I'm running for the West. Uh, so I, this, this is, I, I don't, I couldn't imagine why someone would want to live in Ottawa for a while, but I'm, but I'm ready to do it. Um, I'm, I'm ready to do it. And the reason being is um, uh, I think I've got a great story to tell about the geopolitics of our resources and really understanding the geopolitics of international resource development. Uh, And whether that's heavy industry, oil and gas, agriculture, I have a foot in in either professionally. So I have a ranch service business and an oil and gas consulting company. Um, And and those are the core industries that have built the West. And and the people around them is the people that that built the West. Those are the people I'm speaking for. Um, That's why I'm running. um, And that's why me. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Tarek, for doing this. Um, like I said to my listeners and to my viewers, if you want to follow Tarek, please just scroll down. The show notes are in the uh, the body of the text, whatever you want to call it. Um, and remember, guys, just, well, first off, thank you so much for doing this. It's thank been you, an honor and pleasure. Like I said, we'll have you back on for sure. Likewise. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in for another great episode. We'll be back tomorrow. Talk to you later, guys.